I do not think I am in the process of breaking any of you all. I don't think I'm breaking friends at North Central or East End who are on the end of this camera. I think you guys are going to be just fine. That's my belief and I'm sticking to it. All right, so problem number one, I hope, was a straightforward question. Was that was thing, but that was easy. That was but that was easy. Okay, all right. What made question number one so easy for all the time? Uh, it was worded as Romeo. Almost worded as Romeo. It was worded. Wait, number one? It was like worded like the practice song. Yeah. yeah. Number one was worded like the practice song. I want to make sure I'm looking at the yeah. right one here. Read it. It had equations. Number one was the one about Kelvin, right? Yes. Yeah. Number three was the sum of the squares of two positive numbers. Yes. Yeah. Uh, number two, displacement from the origin, blah, 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 blah. And number five, area of the largest rectangle. Yeah. These are the ones. All right, number one. Oh, excellent, Myra. Your homework assignment will be picked up for a grade, but no one else's will. Yeah. Too late. Too late. Oh, except for Lewis. All right. So, so I, here's the other reason why I think number one is so easy. I gave you the equation. Yes. Yes. You didn't have to figure out the optimization and the constraint and the demand. I gave it to you. I'm like, here, Giselle, do something with it. Right? And so you're like, oh, I'm going to optimize this. So I'm going to take a derivative. I'm going to set it equal to zero. I'm going to solve it, and you should get r equals zero and r equals six as the candidates. Mm -hmm. Everybody okay with this? Yes. Good. All right. Now, you have candidates. Do you have a domain restriction? Yes. 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 So we have a closed interval, and we have a continuous function. Mm -hmm. We know how this story ends. There has to be an absolute max. There has to be an absolute max. has to be. So you're going to then plug in the endpoints, or uh, on this one, I chose to do a number line test. I said going from 0 to 9 at 6, the derivative is equal to 0. So the derivative changes from positive to negative, relative max. And why is this an absolute max? I want to get some hands on this. I care so much about this argument. Why is this relative max also an absolute max? Just Lewis, David, Halimone, Carmen. Why is this relative max also an absolute max, Carmen? Because that r equals 6 is the only point where the derivative changes. Where the derivative <laughs> <laughs> At r equals 6, this is the only place that the derivative change is signed. You change from positive to negative once. Done. That relative max has to be an absolute max. There's no need to evaluate the endpoints. There's no need for anything else. Just land the plane. You're done. Get out of there. All the friends are okay? All right, now number three, I think this one gets hard. Not impossible, but number, oh, no, I'm sorry. I just got the look of like, why aren't we talking about number two? Hello, here's number two. Okay, fine, be that one too. All right. All right, so number three, rather than spoiling all the fun here, what's the, what's the deal with number three? I, I will help with the... Constraint and the optimization, and that's it. Yeah. Number three says, what is number three? Sum of the squares of two positive yeah, numbers. Sum of the squares of two positive numbers is 200. Okay, so we have two numbers. Same number? No. Different numbers here. So I've got like x and y, x is the first number, and y is the second number. Not sure what's happening there with the handwriting. All right, I need the sum of the squares of two positive numbers is 200. The sum of their squares is 200. X squared so plus y squared. X squared plus y squared is equal to 200. Question for y'all. <laughs> Optimization equation or constraint? Constraint. For now, constraint. Constraint. Everyone's okay with constraint. I lay. Why is this a constraint? Because does that help you? Yeah. Maximize. Show you how it maximizes the biggest, greatest product. Okay. What I want is I want to maximize the product, and the product is x times y, right? This is what I want to make big. This is what I'm going to take the derivative of. Okay. This is the constraint. The reason it's the constraint, I lay, is it is telling you the relationship between x and y. I can't pick any rando numbers that I want. They have to satisfy this relationship that x squared plus y squared equals 200. Okay. 
So once you're there, if this is the constraint and that's the optimization equation, you're going to have to solve this one for x or solve this one for y and then plug it in. So I might say, okay, what does this mean? This means that y squared equals 200 minus x squared. So y is the square root of 200 minus x squared. Mm -hmm. So then my product is going to be x times the square root of 200 minus x squared. And this is where my help is going to stop. Once you're here, once you've got your optimization equation in one variable, my hope is you guys know exactly what to do from here. Mm -hmm. What are we going to do? Product rule. And we're going to plot it. Oh, it's, it, right, we're going <laughs> to take a derivative oh. using the product rule. That, it's all right, it's coming from my pocket, it's safe. Okay. Not that my pocket is a safe place to be. Okay. So, product, you're going to take the derivative using the product rule. Okay, great, do that. Set the derivative equal to zero. Solve that equation. Go do all the things. All right, number five is the last one I'm going to offer a little bit of help on. Okay, number five, determine the area of the largest rectangle that can be drawn with one side along the x-axis and two vertices on the curve, y equals e to the negative x squared. I have no idea and would not expect anybody in the room to know what the graph of e to the negative x squared looks like. That's not the thing, which is why I said graph on the calculator. If you graph y equals e to the negative x squared on the calculator, you're going to get something that looks like that, right? You might think, oh, that's the graph of 1 over x squared plus 1. No, it's not. It's the graph of e to the negative x squared. Mm -hmm. yeah. They look similar. Okay. Determine the area of the largest rectangle that can be drawn with one side on the x-axis and two vertices on the curve. What does it even look like? What does it even look like? A square tangle? Now we're making up vocabulary terms. I need a rectangle with one side on the x-axis and two vertices on the curve. What you got? This is going to be like that x squared. The semicircle? It's just like the semicircle oh. thing yesterday. It is just like the semicircle. You need a rectangle. Okay? You need a rectangle. Now, on your calculator, it should show up much cleaner than what I just drew here. You should have an even function. You should have some symmetry going on here. And so you're going to go x spaces to the right before you go up. You're going to come on over. You're going to come back down. This graph clearly does not look symmetric. My apologies <laughs> for that. Okay. But if I want the area, well, what's the area going to be? The area is whatever the length of the rectangle is times the height. How long is the rectangle? 2x. 2x. How tall is the rectangle? Um, e to the e. E. Right. Any point on the curve, the coordinates are going to be x comma e to the negative x squared. So you're going to have 2x times e to the negative x squared. This is what you're going to take the derivative of. This is what you're going to set equal to zero. You're going to do all, all the things. Okay. I have no intention of picking this assignment up right now for a grade. This is a good thing, right? Yes. Okay. Monday, I'm taking this up for a grade. Ready. Make sure it's good. See you tomorrow. You're going to get it done. All right. So, moving on. Shall we? Oh, have you guys all said hello to our guest teacher? <laughs> hello. Hit me. Looking at this portion here, yeah. if you look, if you exponentiate this one to one over f e to power uh, x squared, yep. yeah, and investigate by using a calculator to grab that function, yes, then you can analyze it. Looking at this one, for example, that will bring you to a circle, correct? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can you exactly. wrap that up too? What I'm saying? Like examples, like we're talking about. Okay. I want to see it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you might have a point. Okay. This oh. this function here. This function here. You can reverse this one to be one over e 
x, x squared. Mm -hmm. you, then you compare the transient. What I mean there, if you graph this and graph it, they are going to be, what I mean, no, no parallels. It's going to be the same. Mm -hmm. You agree with me? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, like here, you can just even differentiate this one by saying this is this, and you differentiate this one that this one is, if you consider this one to be you, and I use your, your composite differential. Do you know this? Do oh, composite no. differential. <laughs> do this one, and then differentiate this. That will give you exactly this one here. Did you, you, yeah. do you understand what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. 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 Same, we've got a chain rule. Oh, okay. Okay. And not to disagree with our guest teacher. <laughs> so a couple things here. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, wait, you should wave to all the friends at our North Central and East End campus. There are calculus BC students over there too. Uh, I, I mostly agree with you that if you take the derivative, you're going to get this, but I don't 100% agree with him. I like it, but I don't love it. Because of the sign. Right, you're not going to get the correct sign here. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Now here's the other thing. This guy here represents the function x of uh, y equals e to the negative x squared, but that's not what I'm trying to optimize. I'm trying to optimize the area of the rectangle, so I have to consider the length and the width. Everybody okay? All right, but th thank you. Yes. Thank you for jumping on in there. There aren't that many people that take the marker from <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah, if you look at this one here, this is half. What? You know, if you look at, go back to your statistics, for example, what type of figure is this? You, you learned it. They've actually not taken the statistics course yet, which is why I didn't mention the normal here and here, and here and here. Yeah, it's almost half. You can integrate this one and multiply by two. And we haven't studied the integration yet either. <laughs> oh, okay. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. All right, so here's a... Thank you. I'll get to you later. All right. All right, so here's what I want you guys to do. I want to start with a safe problem, and then we're going to go to a much more interesting... Oh, we're going to remember this forever, aren't we? All right, so on page 30, there is a problem that I think should be a very comfortable one for you. I'm going to give you the first two minutes completely on your own, no help from anybody, to read through this problem. Page 30, one at the top. This should be a comfortable problem, and then we're going to go a little crazy. It's going to be good, but two minutes completely on your own. Remind me, though. Is writing it in your agenda will kill you? I'll have a look at my agenda. Large store wishes to add a fenced in rectangular storage yard of 20,000 square feet. Use 
and the building is one side of the yard. This should sound somewhat familiar. This is like the stuff that we did yesterday. Mm -hmm. Find the minimum amount of fencing that must be used to enclose the remaining three sides. So I've walking around, I saw a lot of folks have like a building, you've got the yard, here's my building, and here's the yard. Now, what I haven't seen is a lot of folks made it to the optimization and the constraint. So let's look at the information. I've got, I need a storage yard of 20,000 square feet. So what? How am I going to use this information? Celeste, what are you going to do? Um, set an equation that says 2, I don't know what it's but 2L plus, uh, plus W equals 20,000. Okay, so I heard 2L plus W is equal to 20,000. How many guys would agree with her on this? We get some agreement here? 2L plus W equals 20,000. Celeste, what does the 20,000 represent? Square feet. Uh, area. It's yeah. area. It's area. Some of the problems we did yesterday were like, oh, we're putting fencing. This is not a fencing question anymore. It's an area question. So you've got 20,000 square feet here. And I agree, I want to be thinking about length and width, but I'm not saying length plus two widths to get to 20,000. What do I need to do? I need to say, oh, that's length times width is going to be 20,000. What is it that we're trying to optimize? Be careful. Read the question carefully. The thing that you're trying to optimize is what you're trying to, I'm saying optimize, but I want you to hear like maximum and minimum. What do I want to minimize? The amount of fencing. So what I need is a fencing equation. And my fencing equation is going to be, I need fencing over here. I need fencing over here. I need fencing over here. Fencing along the building? No. no. Absolutely not. So Celeste, you were kind of, I think what was happening, you were taking one idea and merging it together with another one. So the fencing equation here is going to say two widths plus a length. This is what I want to minimize. And if that's what I want to minimize, I think you guys know how the story ends here. If that's what I want to minimize, this is what I'm going to take a derivative of. This is what I'm going to set equal to zero and do all of those things. David, what's the problem with taking the derivative of this guy here? You've got two different variables on the same side. Good news, you have a constraint equation. This is why you have the constraint equation. Aaron, what are you going to do? Uh, you can say L equals 20,000 divided by W. L is equal to 20,000 divided by W, and that's really important because now you can come over to your fencing equation and say that your fencing equation is 2W plus 20,000 over W. Are all the friends okay? Okay, what we haven't had any conversation about is domain restrictions. My function, my fencing is a function of the width. What are the domain restrictions on the width? Have a conversation with somebody near you. What's the domain restriction on the width? What's the smallest width you could have? What's the biggest width? conversation I was just having with the friends up front, they said the domain restriction would be zero to, what did we say, 10,000? No, that's not, that's not Stephen, why don't you like zero to 10,000? Uh, because um, there's a, well, you could extend all the way to 20,000, not 10,000. Okay, so you want to go from zero to 20,000. Yes. But no bigger than 20,000. Palomino. Uh, 
we'd say is the square root of 20,000. The square yeah. root of 20,000. Why are you saying the square root of 20,000? Because since, since it's the area, yep. we're going to have to find the, the two widths that can multiply two add up to 20,000. Careful. You're not multiplying two widths. You're well, multiplying well, length square. and width to get to 20,000. Yeah. And I'll tell you, I still haven't heard the right domain restrictions. What's the smallest width you could have and still have an area of 20,000? I heard zero. The problem with zero is you plug in, you can't. Oh my god, you multiplied by zero and got one? No, I said you can't multiply by zero. You can't multiply, the width can't be zero. It's the smallest it can be one. Okay, and now this no. is where we get into like faulty thinking. Yeah, you, you guys are thinking numbers. like that the that the number line goes oh like zero, jump to one with nothing in between. Yeah. So Steven, what's the domain restriction? So it would be I guess an open interval. You're gonna have yeah. to use an open interval here. It's not that one is the smallest width. Could you have a width of 0.5? Yes. Yeah. Yes, you absolutely can have a width of 0.5. So you have an open interval. Zero, and your maximum value? So, infinity. <laughs> is infinite. <laughs> the, I think the argument I was hearing earlier was 10,000, because you're thinking I need 10,000 here and 10,000 over here. We're looking at an area, we're not looking at adding these things together. What's the biggest the width could be? And then I heard like 20,000, Think I think it was like 20,000, and then the length is one? But since the length can be smaller than one, the width can be greater than 20,000. So in fact, your domain restriction is from zero to infinity. Which means you cannot use the extreme value theorem. Why not? Why can't we use the extreme value theorem here? There's a really good reason. Only two people? I'm worried that there's only two people. Aaron, why can't we use the extreme value thing? Because oh. the interval is not closed. You don't have a closed interval. You, you, know, you could argue continuous after zero, but you don't have a closed interval. You have no endpoints. So we're going to have to go through and finish this off by like finding the derivative, set this equal to zero, figure it all out. Let's go from there. I still need to take attendance. I need to keep this job, so I need to take attendance. I need to cap the teenager. All of us. Yep, I got 11. We're good. <laughs> Steven, we are filming, right? Yes. Okay. No. I can't wait for the kids at North Central and you tend to be like, Who's that man? That's not Mr. DeRosier. <laughs> <laughs> Stranger. <laughs> but it is clear, our guest teacher is one fiercely intelligent man with a strong math and science background. <laughs> oh wait, you like the line. Yeah, but it's uh how we go about the derivative. You're gonna have to use the question though, indeed. Too close, negative twenty thousand. Oh no, negative. I'm curious, just quick show of hands. How many of you guys are finding the derivative here with quotient rule? Anybody rewriting this as 2,000 times w to the negative 1 and then using power rule? Anybody saying, hey, this is like 1 over x, and I know what the derivative of 1 over x is, and so you just go in there? All three ways are going to get the exact same answer. Your derivative should be 2 minus 20,000 over w squared. Okay. We're going to set that equal to zero. We're going to solve this equation for zero. You guys know my favorite thing of all. Fraction killer. I'm going to multiply by w squared. 2w squared minus 20,000 is equal to zero. Now we've left the world of calculus. We're just doing some algebra. w squared is equal to 10,000. What oh, what would w be equal to? 100. w is going to be the square root of 10,000, which is 100. And the mistake that calculus students make all the time, they get to the 100 and they're like, I'm done, I found it, Palamon, what's the mistake? This is your candidate. 
Now, when we have endpoints, you can take your candidates and you can take your endpoints and you plug them in and you say which one is biggest, which one is smallest. You can't do that here because you don't have endpoints. So your only option left is to look at your number line test and say, okay, here's F prime, here's W equal to 100, here's zero. I can't use anything smaller than zero. So pick some convenient number between zero and 100 that you don't mind working with. 10. 10. How about one? <laughs> I mean, you can make whatever you want, but like think about what you have to do here. You've got to take that number and square it, divide that into 20,000, and subtract from two. Whether you pick one and you've got two minus 20,000, or it's 10 and you get something else, what you're going to get is a negative. Pick something bigger than 100, like whatever bigger than 100 that you want, like a billion, a thousand, a hundred and one, thank you, I feel like I'm at an auction, square it, divide it into 20,000, subtract from two, what are we going to get? Negative. Wait. Positive. Negative? Positive. Positive. But I, and this is why I wanted to go with something extreme, like a million. A million squared is like way big. 20,000 divided by a million squared is way small. Two minus way small? Two. Positive. What do we know? D specific. I need an adjective here. There is a relative minimum. At W equals 100, F has a relative minimum. I agree. And I come back and I say, that is not good enough. I'm not interested in a relative minimum. Andrew, what is it that I want? You're telling me you've got a relative minimum. Great. I'm not interested in a relative minimum. I want a absolute minimum. I need to be convinced that this actually is the absolute minimum. One person, two people, three people. How about some friends up front? How would you convince me, I like, how would you convince me that you actually have an absolute minimum at 100? The W equals 100, it's still, it is the only moment that F prime changes sign. This is the only place where F prime changes sign, right? We, it comes up again. So I'd say maybe something like this. For W greater than 0, F prime changes sign only once. Only once. Therefore, F has an absolute minimum at W equals 100. You've got to be able to go from the relative minimum to an absolute minimum argument. Endpoints, when you've got them, just plug in the endpoints, that's easy. When you don't have the endpoints, look for the change, do your number line test, and we're going to be okay. All the friends are okay? Mm -hmm. All right, so let's push on to a harder one, shall we? If you guys flip back to page 29, this is the one I'm going to need David to drive in a little bit. This is the one I really wanted to start us with, but based on the conversation we had when you guys came in, starting here didn't feel right. So here's what I recommend you do. Read through this. Get yourself a diagram. Look for an optimization equation. Look for a constraint. Look for some domain restrictions if you've got them. We'll talk in a few minutes and definitely enlist the help of the peers. And Stephen, is the camera set up so we'll catch both horns? Now it is going.
So here's the good news. When it comes to the AP exam, they will give you the volume formula. Although I don't really think many people are struggling with the volume formula. You've got a cylinder. Prop, the thing that a lot of folks remember from geometry, they're like volume is like big base times the height. Area for the base. Pi R squared. Okay, volume equals pi R squared times the height. My question for you, optimization or constraint? Not one. Read the question. Optimization or constraint? Optimization or constraint? Read the question. Optimization or constraint? Meyer, what do you think? Is this the optimization equation or the constraint equation? Are you sure? How did you make that decision? Because the Oh, I didn't even flip the page. All right, so they tell you that the volume is 355. So that has to be your constraint. So this guy over here is your constraint. Now, if they're going to be kind and they're going to give you the constraint equation, I'll tell you they're also going to give you the optimization equation. All right, I wanted you guys to spend a little bit of time on this, but surface area, if I think about painting this can, if I would think about painting all sides of the can, well, what do I need to do? I need to paint the top. Area for the top? Pi R squared. There's another one on the bottom, so clearly 2 pi R squared. Plus, I need to paint the, I think of it as like the label on the can. And I want to use that idea of a label on purpose. Think about the soup can. Right? What happens with that label, you cut the label, you lay it out, and what do you get? A rectangle. The rectangle has a length equal to the circumference of the can. So that's going to be your 2 pi r. And it has a height of h. I would not expect you guys in the middle of a test to come up with this equation. Okay. This is not the thing I want you to worry about. You've got the constraint. This guy over here is the optimization equation. Okay, what do we think about um, domain restrictions? Is there a smallest height for the can? Is there a biggest height for the can? Definitely the height cannot be negative. That doesn't make sense. Could the height be zero? No. Right, like these are the questions you want to like go through in your head. Could the height be zero? No, because then I wouldn't have my 355, 335. It's zero to infinity. Right, so actually you're going to go from zero to infinity for the radius and for the height. I thought that was a square root. I'm like, what? All right, so David or Aaron, which one of you guys wants to drive? David, you're going to drive? You're the emergency driver. Thank you very much. And I need to plug in. Why do I not plug in? Yep. There you go. Oh, and you're going to have to hit function F8. 
All right, looking good. All right, so let's let's take a gander at this. What we've got is our cylinder, and this cylinder is set up in such a way that it has a volume of 355 cubic centimeters. This this is the goal. This is the goal. All right, so David, I want you to hit where it says, what does it say, sweep R? Right, so we're changing the radius. This is supposed to represent our can that has a volume of 355. An excellent observation. You wouldn't drink from a soda can that looks like this. What would you do? You'd be like... <laughs> and you probably wouldn't drink from a soda can that's this tall and that narrow. There's some logical limitations here. Everybody okay? Yeah. Our goal is to figure out what's the best way to build this soda can. Alright, so David, whenever you think you've got a great soda can, All right. you just stop it. Right, now would be a bad time. Now would be a very bad soda can. Okay, and actually, David, if you want to, work, you see where it says drag? <laughs> Click on that point, and you can go back and forth. There you go. Pretty good? Yeah. All right, David, now let's go further. I want you to click the button that says show R, comma, SA. Yep. What you're getting right now is a graph of radius compared to surface area. For a particular radius, this graph is going to tell you the surface area. Now, did David get the best, best way to do this? About? Feeling pretty good based on the graph? Lewis, convince me based on the graph that he's chosen well. Uh, the minimum? Yeah. Uh, it's well, all right, we, we seem to actually be at the minimum. I can see the minimum. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, this is a relative minimum or an absolute minimum? Absolute. It's, it's both. It's looking like both. Relative minimum or absolute minimum? What's looking like? Both. I mean, both. This is actually both, right? It meets both definitions. The function changes from decreasing to increasing. That's our definition for relative minimum. And our definition for absolute minimum? The lowest point. This is the lowest point. This is clearly the lowest point. Everybody okay? Mm -hmm. All right, good. David? Get rid of that graph and show me the derivative graph. Have a conversation with somebody near you. Have we found the absolute minimum? If so, why? I want to hear the words. What's the derivative doing in that one? All right. Right there. <laughs> so if you had the graph of radius versus surface area, relative minimum, absolute minimum conversation, easy to do, right? When you've got the graph of the derivative, you're going to have to think about, oh, derivative is changing from negative to positive, relative minimum. And what makes this an absolute minimum? The only It is the only change. That's what I need to hear in your justification all the time. And this is the only place where there's a change, therefore it is the absolute minimum. Everybody good? Nice. David, welcome. Come on back. And you guys might want to take out your calculators for this. I want to do some real high-powered calculus. We're going to get through this problem in the next 12 minutes, I hope, even if I have to break you all in the process, but we're going to be okay. And Giselle, if you can make sure I tell everybody what the homework is this weekend, that'd be good. All right. No, Ayla's a good girl. She's going to do it. And my dog from the camera is giving me a hard time. There we go. All right. So let's let's return to where we were. Volume is pi r squared h, 355. 
my surface area. This is what I'm trying to optimize. I want to take a derivative. This is clearly not going to go well for us to take the derivative. Too many variables. Too many variables. So we need to use the constraint. If you're going to go back to the constraint, you have to make a decision. Which one do you want to solve for? Radius or height? Radius. Right. If you're thinking about what would be easier to solve for, I think height would be easier oh, to solve for. Yeah. Okay, so like here we go. So you know that pi r squared times height is equal to 355. So h is, what is it, 355 over pi r squared. My surface area equation is 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r h, but we're not going to do with that. We've got 2 pi r squared plus 2 pi r times 355 over pi r squared. Can I successfully take a derivative of this equation? Sure. Derivative rules that derivative rules that I need here. I see a product rule. Definitely, I see a power rule. Quotient rule. Sum rule. Maybe the sum rule. You're like that's stupid. Everyone knows the sum rule. Okay. But product rule for sure. Power rule. Quotient rule stuff. Unless you see some clever algebra. Yeah. Where's the clever algebra that is going to make your life better? <laughs> there has to be some algebra here that's going to make life good. <laughs> Anybody see some good algebra here? Celeste? Uh, you said multiply 2 pi r times 355 over pi r squared, and then that will get, that, that get rid of... 2 pi r times 355 over pi r squared. Okay, Want to get rid of some stuff? Yes. What are you going to get rid of? Uh, the pi. one of the pi r squared. Alright, the pi is going to cancel out for yes. sure. I've got an r and I've got an r squared on the denominator. And so 2 times 355 is going to be 710 over r. That's what I'm going to take the derivative of. So sa prime, derivative of 2 pi r squared, I know you guys know that. 4 pi r. Derivative of 710 over r. Just like before, quotient rule works. Rewrite and use the power rule works. Just know, like, hey, this looks a lot like 1 over x, and I know that derivative, it's just a different variable and a constant. Either way, negative 710 over r squared. That's the derivative. You're going to set that equal to 0. You're going to solve it for r after a while. You start to realize the moves all kind of look and feel the same. I'm going to multiply by my common denominator. 4 pi r cubed minus 710 is equal to 0. Solve this for r. What are we going to do? We're going to add 710 to the other side. Divide both sides by 4 pi. And then take the cubed root. So r is the cubed root of 710 over 4 pi. That's like the perfect numerical answer. As a decimal, if somebody could get this over to a decimal for me, that would probably be good. Cube root is 710 over 4 pi. 3.837. Three, can I get somebody to confirm that? 3.837. Yeah. Carmen, 3.837. Ailey's got 3.837. Units over here? Centimeters. So the soda can that is optimal has a radius of 3.837 centimeters. Just the radius. Has, what I said was a radius of 3.837 centimeters. Good. Now, I'm, I wish we hadn't gone so fast with the geometry sketch pad because if you could remember what the graph of the derivative looked like, the, the minimum happened somewhere right around here at 3.837. Now, here's the thing. Do not fall for it. 
We haven't proven that this is the absolute minimum. We've proven that this is the relative minimum. It's our candidate. You know, because you know what the graph looks like, that this has to be a relative minimum and an absolute minimum. And you know from derivative stuff. So are we okay if we stop here? Yeah. All right, so here's tonight's homework. Tonight's homework, where did it go? Um, it's in the student packet. It's not in the problem set packet. In the student packet, so you're already in the packet. Just go forward a little bit. If you go to lesson 58, there are some practice problems. It says partner practice. I just want you to do the problems that are on page 33. There's three of them. You have the hints at the bottom if you need some help with the optimization and the constraint equations, because I think that's where the challenge comes from. Okay. Or I may have called it the objective function instead of the optimization equation. Same thing. Here's what I would encourage you guys to do. Let's get started on the homework. Um, options one, two, and three. Get as far as you can. I would encourage you guys to cover up the hints. There are some super smart people in the room. Don't look at the hint yet. When you need to look at the hint, look at the hint. from like how do I go from word problem to equation and take some action. Greater than, oh, yeah. not that it exists, it's greater than or equal to all the other y values on the table. That's oh, just the same. Oh, I didn't even read the rest C of the C special because the y value at that point is greater than or equal to all of the other ones. Okay. 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 Okay.
mean, that's the only part I read. I was like, I looked at the ends because I was like, okay, what happened in the differences? It's easier. And then I was like, it's easier. I was like, is that right? And so I made sure I was like, I didn't miss what I heard. Since all of them were open, did you count those equations or is that because the problem is asking? And I had to raise five minutes. The problem is asking. Yeah, but I was like. What? Okay, so you're able to come up with the optimization because we were talking about error. And the constraint, why is it that x squared plus y squared? I thought we wouldn't have any kind of error. Yes. That's where they came from. That's just. I like you. Oh. All righty, friends.